Hello, and welcome to part two of my introduction to quantum computing series. Last episode, we briefly discussed the basics of quantum computing and the two main types of quantum computers, gate-based computers and annealers. Today, we're going to be discussing how to write Cubo equations and annealer matrices. Preparing a problem for annealer solving starts with writing a Cubo equation. Cubo equations are mathematical equivalents of certain real-world problem constraints, so a few examples of such constraints could be the problem of class peers at the same hour. In this case, the constraint in English is I can take either calculus or psychology for my 5 p.m. slot, but not both. There's a whole lot of real-world example constraints that you can use for these problems on annealers, and they all start with writing a Cubo equation that defines them mathematically. Let's try out an example. We'll start off with a basic Cubo equation like this one. Our equation is a1 x1 plus a2 x2 plus b12 x1 x2 plus c, where c is a constant. Before we actually discuss how we're going to do this, we need to break down this equation and understand what each part of it really means. Let's take a look at the various parts of the equation. The x1 and x2 are variables. They stand for the presence or absence of a specific property. Because this is a cubo equation, this means that they can either have a value of 0 or 1. And this can stand for anything when you're defining a condition as a cubo equation. x1 could be whether a shirt is red or not, or x2 could be whether a shirt is blue or not, and you could define the equation so that one of them must have a value of 1, while the other has a value of 0. Really, it's up to the condition you're defining at hand. a1, a2, and b12 are what actually define the condition cubo equation. They're constants that are unique to the problem you're trying to solve, meaning you have to find them for each separate condition. And the way you're going to get these constants is by using systems of equations. So let's take our example here. We have our condition in English. Either x1 or x2 must be true, and they cannot both be true. So let's take a look at the four possible combinations for x1 and x2 arrangements. You have one where both are set to zero, one where x1 is set to 1 and x2 is set to 0, one where x1 is set to 0 and x2 is set to 1, and the final combination where both x1 and x2 have a value of 1. So two of these possibilities fulfill our condition, and two of them don't. The way annealers determine whether a solution is optimal or suboptimal is by reading the energy levels of a potential equation. In the last video, I discussed how quantum annealers create a multi-dimensional energy graph out of their matrix inputs, and then find the optimal solution by finding the lowest point. By the same logic, we're going to want the viable possibilities to have a low energy, and the two solutions that do not fulfill our condition to have a higher energy. For simplicity's sake, let's give our two viable possibilities energies of 0, and the solutions that do not satisfy the condition energy values of 1. So we have our energy values assigned. Now, let's find out a1, a2, and b12's values. And this is where our system of equations comes in. The energy values that we just assigned to the possibilities above are supposed to be equal to their respective cubo equations after plugging in the values of x1 and x2. As an example, let's look at our first possibility. In this one, both x1 and x2 are equal to 0, so we know the solution isn't viable and the energy level is equal to 1. So we plug in x1 and x2, we set that equal to the energy level, and we get a1 times 0 plus a2 times 0 plus b1 2 times 0 plus c is equal to 1. All of the zeros cancel out, and we're left with c is equal to 1. So now in this first equation of alone, we have found the value of our constant c. All right, so let's move on to the next equation. Here we have the case where x1 is equal to 1 and x2 is equal to 0. Since this is a viable solution, the energy level on the solution is 0, because we want it to be one of the lowest points in the annealer graph, and we can plug in x1, x2, and c to get a1 plus 1 is equal to 0, meaning a1 is equal to negative 1. So slowly but surely, we're starting to find our constants and assemble our completed cubo equation. We now move on to the third possibility, where x1 is equal to 0 and x2 is equal to 1. Like the second possibility, this one is viable and has an energy level of 0. It's very similar to the previous equation, actually. We plug in x1, x2, and c once again. We can plug in the newly found a1, but it doesn't really matter because with x1 being 0, that component is cancelled out. We end up with a2 plus 1 equals 0, and a2 is equal to negative 1. Now all we need is the constant b1, 2. 
Our final possibility uses all of the constants that we found in the previous equations. Both x1 and x2 are equal to 1, meaning that this is not a viable solution, and the energy level must be equal to 1. So we plug in all of our constants, and we have here our final incomplete iteration of our Cubo equation. Negative 1 plus negative 1 plus b12 plus 1 is equal to 1. This reduces to b12 is equal to 2. And there you have it, our completed Cubo equation for a constraint. We've essentially translated our English constraint of either x1 or x2 must be true at all times, and only one of them can be true, into a Cubo mathematical equivalent. But we've got to take one more step before we're actually able to run this on a quantum annealer. Quantum annealers can only solve optimization problems when presented with matrices, and those matrices have very specific requirements. The size of an annealer's matrix proportions is directly proportional to the amount of variables in the original constraint. For example, we have two variables in our condition, x1 and x2. Therefore, the matrix we're going to use is a 2x2 two two matrix. Now, the values in this matrix might look familiar, and that's because they are. Those values are exactly the same as the ones that we see in our Cubo equation. Since we already know the values for a1, a2, and b12, all we have to do is plug them in, and there we have it. Our completed matrix. There it is, the annealer equivalent to our English condition. But what we found now was a simple 2x2 two two matrix. Some conditions are much longer than our simple example. How would we write a cubo for these complex conditions? To answer that question, we'll have to discuss what our constants and variables actually mean in a physical qubit array. The variables in our equations, until now referred to as instances of x, are defined in a cubo equation as either 0 or 1, representing either the presence or absence of a specific condition. However, the real importance behind these variables lies in the fact that they represent qubits in a quantum annealer. Quantum annealers are essentially vast networks of interconnected qubits, each with their separate weight values. These weight values are the constants A that were used in our Cubo equation. For example, in our recent example, B12 represents the weight values connecting the qubits assigned to variables x1 and x2. It's quite literally the weight between two qubits. But in a more complex Cubo equation with more variables, it is important to remember that this weight value of B exists between all the possible qubit combinations. Therefore, if you had, let's say, a Cubo equation with three variables, x1, x2, and x3, you'd have the standard weight variable combinations a1x1, a2x2, and a3x3 in the equation, but you'd also have b12x1x2, b13x1x3, and b23x2x3. These weight values between the qubits only really affect the problem if the x2 and x3 values are both through are both true, or have a value of 1, and that makes sense, because the weight value is connected to both of the qubits and requires both of them to work. Okay, so in the last example, we had our predetermined matrix with the names of constants whose values we just filled in. But what's the format for bigger matrices? Let's remember what our last matrix looked like. We had two variables, x1 and x2, so we used a 2x2 two two matrix. The bottom left corner of the matrix was 0, empty. The diagonal line stretching from the top left to the bottom right across the midline of the matrix held all of the A constants in ascending order, and the top right corner held our B1, 2 constant. And conveniently enough, our 3x3 three three matrix is very similar. Once again, the A constants run in an ascending diagonal line from the top left corner to the bottom right corner, and the bottom left corner is, once again, 0. These are repeating patterns in cubo matrices, no matter what size they are, or how many variables we have to deal with. On the top right, however, a new pattern emerges. We weren't able to see this before as our 2x2 two two matrix is too small, but the B constants on the top row are the connections that include the qubit assigned to x1, or the first qubit, while the B constants on the second row are the connections that include the qubit assigned to x2, or the second qubit. So we have B12 and B13 on the top row, and B23 on the middle row. Notice how none of the connections are repeated. There's no b21, for instance, because b21 is the weight value between qubit 1 and qubit 2, and it's exactly the same value as b12. It's the exact same thing. The matrix should always fit perfectly. And this pattern goes on forever, no matter how many variables you're dealing with. Bottom left of the matrix is filled with 0. 
A values form an ascending line from the top left to the bottom right, and the B values fill in the top right with the weight value connections to the first qubit filling up the first row, the second qubit filling up the second row, and so on and so forth. Thank you very much for watching my single cubo equation matrix construction video. This is part two of my introduction to quantum computing series, so feel free to check out the first one. Uh, the next video, I'm going to be talking about how to cover matrices that have multiple cubo equations and therefore multiple constraints or multiple conditions that you want satisfied. I'll see you then.